I appreciate it. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk to you today. I'm going to just share my experience in the Galapagos. As many of you know, I went to the Galapagos in October. Um, so, right in front of this is all about why I went, what I was doing. Um, so, I kind of wanted to take a quick poll of you. Um, what do you know about the Galapagos? Where is the Galapagos? Why is it kind of famous? Charles Darwin. Yeah, it's famous for his experiment. Charles Darwin, yeah, that's kind of what everybody knows. Iguanas. Her Iguanas. The <laughs> one footed boobies. The one footed boobies, exactly. It's not really unique yeah. because it's isolated or uh, it's got a weird evolutionary. Yeah. There's certain things that have evolved there and it's kind of isolated. Yeah, so <laughs> basically, yeah, I think a lot of people know about the Galapagos because they know of Darwin. Darwin went there, he was a scientist, um, and he kind of, he developed the theory of evolution, right? It's kind of a big, big deal. And everybody thinks of, um, he's famous for the finches, like all the finches that evolved in the different niches. Um, funny enough, it actually started with the Galapagos Mockingbird, was really the species that he was collecting and studying initially, and then it kind of branched out to the, the famous finches. But so where is the Galapagos? South America. South America. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're in the right the right region of the world. It's so much better than the last time I had <laughs> So yeah, that that's where it is. Um, so here we are up in Reno, where the heart is. Uh, the Galapagos is basically about 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador. And it is quite a journey to get there. Um, from Reno, it basically took 36 hours, uh, four flights, two buses, two ferries, for me and my team to get to um, Isabella Island. And a very um, long nap at the end. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, we got there uh, about 5 p.m. and um, basically a dinner went to bed because we had to get up the next morning and start working. But um, so we dropped, we basically dropped one team off in Santa Cruz while um, our team continued on to Isabella. This ferry ride, two and a half hours of nonstop, horrible, rough weather. The woman across the aisle from us was throwing up like crazy. Oh, <laughs> it, it was, it was torture. <laughs> and it was kind of open. So, um, Part of us recovered, but the people in the way back part of the boat, it wasn't like a big ferry like we're used to with the cars drive on. No, it was kind of like a yacht fishing boat. People in the back got soaked because the waves were just flying over them. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> uh, we were all like, how much is the flight? Because we were totally quiet the next time. Um, this is the organization that I went with. This is Animal Balance. Animal Balance is, um, they're really not based anywhere. The founder lives in Oregon, uh, but she is constantly traveling. So um, it's basically a non-governmental organization. This is their mission statement. To collaborate with communities in need, create sustainable, humane, non-human animal management programs. Any night social social change, so it's a really broad mission statement. Um, more specifically, the goals of this organization are um, spay neuter programs or um, reproduction control programs, and I'll tell you more about that in a couple slides. Um, basically control overpopulation of pets, uh, reduce, eliminate inhumane population control, you know, that's basically rounding up animals and killing them. Uh, which we don't really want to do. Uh, decrease disease, uh, decrease, eliminate predation on the ecosystem of the Galapagos. So as we were just saying, the Galapagos has a very unique ecosystem, all these special endemic species. Um, you've got feral dogs and feral cats can pretty much decimate all those special animals really quickly if we don't control their populations. This organization supports and trains local veterinarians and organizations. And the ultimate goal is really to be obsolete because the organization wants to go in, help set up these programs and structures, and then get out, you know, give, give a, 
the islands, um, the populations that they're helping, the tools to be able to do it themselves. So the programs they have going on, they have one in the Galapagos. Currently they have one in America, Samoa. Um, one in Colombia with hippos. I'll circle back to that because that's a really cool program. Uh, one in the Navajo Nation, Central Texas, and I guess there is one coming soon to the Canary Islands. So it's, they're pretty, pretty broad, <laughs> kind of got their fingers in lots of little pies. Um, just real quick about the hippos. So where are hippos from? Africa? Yeah. What are they doing in Colombia? <laughs> oh, that was from the, the drug smuggler. Oh, I love how he looked at you and continued. Yeah, he's like, I've been watching him the entire time. Yeah. Did yeah. Pin have a bunch on a farm and they yeah. all escaped and they let them go? Sure. Yes. Oh, that's so cool. Yes. Yes. Who is it? So I don't know who is who are. Probably, yeah. But yeah, so rich people do wild things, crazy things. <laughs> the next Tiger King, but hippos. Yeah, yeah, but so there's all these, <laughs> these hippos now um, in, in Colombia. And the local people, it's become a tourist attraction, it's become a local thing. Um, and, but it is an overpopulation problem. So they're it's trying to come up with creative ways to manage this hippo population and um, nobody wants to just cull them. So Animal Balance is working with the government of Colombia to come up with um, some kind of spay neuter program. program for hippos. More of a, I think, you, it's really difficult to spay and neuter a hippo. As you can <laughs> so, yeah, they're um, trying to come up with go through. Yeah. Trying to come up with some oral medication or injectable, you know, uh, birth control, birth control for the hippos. So, Stay, stay tuned. Yeah, very cool program. So, how did I get involved with Sarah, those Animal are Balance? Um, Another I basically I knew about them, and I knew that they went to the Galapagos. I can't remember how, you know, from vet school or something. But um, I knew that they had a program in Texas, and um, I knew that in order to get invited to the Galapagos, you had to go work with Animal Balance in the United States somewhere. So you had to try out essentially. Uh, so I went to Texas in 2019, um, did a week long spay neuter uh, mash program campaign with them there. So here's our, our group, our Texas group. And they must have liked me because they invited me to go to the Galapagos in 2020. Well, you know what happened in 2020, right? <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so I didn't go in 2020, and then in 2021, Joe was kind enough to let me take the time off to be able to go. Um, and you were supposed to bring a hippo back for Sarah, but you forgot. A hippo. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted for Christmas. He jumped off the back of the ferry. <laughs> with Animal Balance. So there's there's lots of islands um, and then and there hasn't been much vet care on any of the islands until you know the 2000s essentially. Um, so one of the um, programs uh, that we launched on this campaign is a megasterol acetate trial. Uh, this is basically a steroid that can be given orally to cats to help prevent them um, from coming into heat. And so this is not a long-term solution, but it is a stopgap um, until those cats can be brought in for um, surgery to be spayed. 
So as female cats essentially are given this drug, you can drop it in their food once a week. So it can be given to pet cats. It's also um, being used in some port feral colonies um, to help kind of control the population until those animals can get, get spayed. So that was one of the goals for the campaign that I went on was to, to get this drug out there and to launch that, that trial. All right, so our clinic on Isabella, um, we ran our clinic out of this building, the Intercultural Outreach Institute, and um, so they were one of our partners. And in the picture, you can see the folks showing up with their pets uh, to be spayed and neutered. It was really great. They, they really want to take advantage of the opportunity. It's free. There's no charge. Um, so here they all are. Um, the, the, the traps were loaned out to owners to transport their cats. So these are pet cats. These are not feral cats that were trapped. Um, and then you can see in this picture, everybody is intermingled here. And immediately after they were checked in, we brought the cats inside and put towels on them um, so they were not like out there with dogs in their faces the whole, the whole morning. Um, also getting them out of the sun because it's the tropics got to, yeah, not too hot, but it was 80, 80 degrees and humid outside. <laughs> was it a strictly Spanish-speaking populace? Yes, yes. Um, funny thing about that is they require you to be fluent in Spanish to go on these trips, and so I was really nervous about that. I even took a Spanish class, and turned out I was probably one of the most fluent people <laughs> on our team. <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> it was a good thing we, we did actually have some bilingual Ecuadorians helping us, <laughs> so that was good. But here we are getting checked in. They get numbers with duct tape on their heads so we can keep track of them. <laughs> We're gonna start doing that with you all. <laughs> yes. um, when you do these kinds of campaigns, you don't really know what kind of facilities you're gonna have. You don't know if you're gonna be outside, inside, what the weather's gonna do, so you kinda of gotta be ready to adapt and just go with it. So our entryway and kitchen, this became our exam room um, and our instrument prep miscellaneous. So here we are doing pre-op physical exams. Um, it's an owner helping to give trazodone during the, the pre-op exam. And this is our recovery area, and this is kind of an overview of what it looked like. Um, this is that, that first room. It's me giving sub-Q fluids to this little puppy dog who was a little bit too sick to have surgery. She did fine, she recovered, and I'm thinking we caught her on the next campaign last month. Um, next to that uh, kitchen, there was a classroom, and so the classroom became basically our surgical prep surgery area. Um, IV catheters were placed in all the patients. Almost all of them were intubated. Uh, and even doctors jump in and help with placing catheters and intubating. So everybody gets a hand in, in everything, um, especially when you have a small team. Everybody has to kind of be able to do everything. And this is just another picture of these. We had two surgical tables set up. This is Dr. Lauren. Uh, so it was Dr. Lauren and I, and we had an Ecuadorian veterinarian who um, would do surgery as well. So we had three vets kind of rotating crew doing surgery. Yep, using every inch of space. So surgical prep and surgery on the same table sometimes. <laughs> so Dr. Laura, Lauren finishing up surgery, Elsa intubating a cat for the, the next one. Um, lighting is often bad, although we had a pretty good surgical light, um, but you can see we have our headlamps on. Um, challenges of field clinics. You kind of never know what, what's going to happen. So they brought us a great big ox oxygen, oxygen tank, oxygen tank, <laughs> uh, and the regulator was broken. So we had to kind of scramble. We ended up going to the local human hospital and borrowing one from them. but. Lots of different um, different drugs, different drug concentrations. Um, we used an instant 
pot for our autoclave, but it got smashed in transport, <laughs> pretty much rendering it useless. So we had to use a cold sterile situation. So that was basically putting the instruments in a, a disinfectant solution. But, and that's that disinfectant solution that we were using for the instruments. Uh, these are little pulse ox, human pulse oxes. Uh, they didn't actually end up working for the animals. Um, we revised our drug charts probably five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. <laughs> um, as we kind of, we had lots of problems with the drugs this time, but we finally kind of got it sorted out. Um, very cool. There's an injectable form of tramadol that is available in Latin America. That's not something that's available here. Um, it worked beautifully as it's a pain med and we used it um, as in the pre-op, um, um, the, the pre-op co cocktail. So that, that was kind of cool. So something that learned. Did you guys have a crash cart? We did, yes. We, we definitely had a crash cart and um, that was, in this room where we kind of set up, we had our emergency drugs that were all there ready to go too. Um, so here's our little team on Isabella, just the five of us from Animal Balance. Um, Fernando was a uh, veterinary student from Ecuador and um, uh, Lisette was our Ecuadorian veterinarian who was helping us out. So these two, uh, she didn't speak in English, but Fernando was fluent bilingual, so he did most of the translating. Um, he was awesome and really interested in learning too. So, so that's the whole team. Like, you, do they have techs? That's it. Doctors. That's us. That, that's it. Wow. So recovery. No, sorry, recovery. So doctor. This is our tech. Hands-on tech, basically. Um, recovery doctor. Um, this is. Is a, uh, also is drawing up drugs basically and kind of prepping. Yeah. That's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> How many surgeries did you do in a day? Well, not that many, really. Okay. We probably did about thirty. Um, we tried to cut off at twenty-five. Uh, were regulations for techs kind of the same, or no. did, like did they have to be licensed, or as long as they knew? Uh. Ooh, that is a good question. I am not sure on these campaigns. Um, with Animal Balance, I don't know that that organization requires you to be licensed. It probably depends on where they're working. Yeah, because I know like, I think Texas and Oregon don't require you to have a license to be a tech, but like Nevada it does. Yes, so. yeah. So I think when they're doing campaigns in Texas, it doesn't, like it doesn't matter. In Ecuador, I'm thinking we get kind of a special pass. <laughs> On, on that, yeah, because it's all hands on deck. If anybody who could do anything, you just you do it. So that's kind of cool because you can get a lot of experience that way too. Um, all right, I want to share this special case with you. Um, we are there basically to do spay and neuter, um, but you know, inevitably, the person will come up to us and say, "Hey, can you look at my dog? You know, this has been going on because they don't have a vet there on the island, right?" So um, our waitress at our hotel one morning came up to us and said, hey, my neighbor's dog has a cut on its throat. You know, would you mind taking a look at it? So um, we said, yeah, you know, have, have bring the dog by. You know, we'll, we'll take a peek for sure. Um, the dog's name is Princess. She's a young female dog. She had a laceration on her neck for about three months. Uh, this lacera laceration was actually all the way into her trachea. Um, and unfortunately, this is the first time I've seen this, but I was told that um, in third world countries, this is kind of a common injury where the collar is put on too tight when the dog is a puppy and not loosened as the animal grows. So the collar of the rope just grows into their neck. Uh, I'm gonna show a photo of what it looked like. It's a gross picture. So if you're a queasy, <laughs> you may not wanna look. Uh, that's what Princess's neck actually look like and yet you are looking into the trachea. That's her windpipe. Yeah, that is her windpipe. <laughs> I love, still, sorry. Still, still <laughs> <laughs> one might be a little bit um, Sorry, Nayla. No, no, you warned me. I still love it. I couldn't do it. Here, I still do it again. So the wonderful thing is we got to fix this for free for this person. 
Yeah, so we took a we took some videos of it too, but you can actually see, yeah, the the ET tube in the trachea. So in order to be efficient, uh, we did her spay and her neck repair at the same time. <coughs> so there's Dr. Lauren doing the neck repair and I'm spaying her. Um, so we got that done pretty quick. That's what it looked like post-op. Is there any, this is probably a question for after, but is there any like special way to repair a trachea or did you just suture it? You debride and suture. Okay. Great. Anything to do with the tracheal ring? Yeah, you, you would go around the tracheal ring. Yep, you just basically suture it closed. And ideally, we would probably use a non-absorbable suture, but we didn't have any, so we used what we had. We used a big, you know, ought suture and closed so it up. So hopefully some first intention healing will help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have to re-intubate her after you took out the, after you closed the first one? No, she was, she was intubated the whole time. So you didn't go through the hole, you could just do the tube. Yeah, it's so the tube went through, through the mouth, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we're just closing the, the rings up. Okay. Yeah. Cool. It's actually fairly simple surgery. Yeah, and Lauren's done, Dr. Lauren has done a couple of them. And I'm calling her Dr. Lauren because I can't even remember what her last name is now, so I apologize for that. <laughs> Um. <laughs> okay. It's amazing that she didn't get infected. So this is what we see. Most street animals worldwide in developing nations die from horrid infections because the smallest wound, especially in a tropical climate, gets infected so quickly. Hers actually looked really clean and, yeah. and tidy, yeah. which mm -hmm. is fantastic. Amazing. Um, but well done to the team, for sure. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. Wild. You've changed that animal's life. Yep. Oh, okay. Absolutely. And they... I think it was last month they were there and they went back and saw her and, um, and, and the dog is doing fine. So, yeah, it's great. That's Princess. And she was, of course, an absolutely sweet dog, as all island dogs are. Well adjusted, very, very sweet dogs. <laughs> so, uh, our campaign this is just kind of a list of the accomplishments uh, between the two teams. Uh, over five days, we did 360 surgeries on two different islands. Um, all animals got vaccines. Um, all animals got collars and leashes and frontline, which came from uh, SPCA of Northern Nevada. Whoop, whoop. Oh. Whoop, whoop. That's amazing. Um, the MA contraceptive program was launched. That's that megasterol acetate program. Blood from all dogs for a DNA sequencing project. So um, there was a, um, a researcher with us on this program who is researching island dogs and sort of the genetics and um, is kind of doing a mini study on the evolution of the dogs in the Galapagos, uh, which is kind of cool. So we'll see uh, what his research uh, comes back as. And then the um, governmental organization collected blood from cats, and they're doing disease monitoring on things like toxoplasmosis um, and uh, a couple other diseases I think that they're screening for, so that's cool. And then cross-training happened. Um, who can tell me oh, how this could be, this situation right here could be improved? Covering the cats. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Not putting so, them right next to each other. Yeah. <laughs> this was not our island. <laughs> this was the other team. Just look at it. So. But, huh? Those of us out there looking at it, yeah. I can imagine that they were not happy. Not happy. And it goes to show, you know, worldwide, I mean, nationwide, we have such a shortage of vets and vet med teams. Worldwide, it gets even worse, and there's no real system for behavior training. So again, we're just so fortunate here that we were able to help learn and spread that information. Yeah. Uh, for the two projects they took blood for, do you think that those will be published? Because I would love to see yeah. both of those. The second one, probably not. That's okay. just an internal, internal study. But um, Tim Dem Dempsey, Dr. Dempsey, I think he is a researcher at North Carolina. Um, yeah, I imagine I'll probably be able to get a hold of his his paper okay. when it comes out. Yeah, that would be cool. It'll be pretty cool. He's been collecting data from like all over the world, all, all sorts of different islands on dogs for several years now. 
Yeah, so it should be a really interesting study. All right, so part of the, part of the thing I wanted to talk about is that um, you may feel like, well, what does this have to do with me? Yeah, she went on this cool trip to the Galapagos and spayed and neutered a bunch of animals, but just to kind of bring it home and make it more relevant for, for you guys is um, just historically pet population control it's been inhumane and ineffective. Um, how, how do you think islands or even cities have tried to control their animal populations in the past? They cull them, which they go through trucks and they pick up the street animals, dogs and cats together, and they either shoot them, slice their throat, or they gas them in gas chambers. The problem is they die very slow, horrific deaths. You can imagine not the, the throats aren't always cut, the gas doesn't always work the bullet sometimes misses and then they die anguish deaths. But equally horrific is there's nothing controlling the population from regrowing again. I probably should have listened to that. <laughs> no. you, I couldn't have said it better, so thank you. And yeah. drowning is more economical. Yeah. yeah. What? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Rocks and... My dad grew up in the dictatorship of Spain and he was drowning cats. Yeah, so... Not, right, it's not only is it inhumane, but it is ineffective. It has been proven in studies that when you eliminate a population of animals by culling them, the remaining population has larger litters and they move into that gap, that area that was left empty by the animals that were taken away. It's been shown with coyotes, it's been shown with dogs and cats all over the world. So. You and I, this organization, we're all part of this um, kind of this new way of thinking and the education and the research is now showing that you have to control the population before they're born. So spay and neuter programs, um, sterilization programs for hippos, <laughs> um, megasterol acetate, whatever it is, we gotta get to the animals before they have the, their litters. That's just a much more humane way of doing it. And um, you guys are a part of it. You are coming, I'm gonna use this term, coming of age <laughs> at a time yes. when, <laughs> You know, there's a huge mental shift in how we how we control populations, and it's it's really awesome. Um, so, what we do matters at home and abroad, and you guys you guys are a part of that. Can I just add one quick thing? Yeah. Thank you. Um, for those of you who don't know, we are fortunate enough. Our board president is a phenomenal subject matter expert when it comes to better studying and understanding really how to count. Uh, community animal populations. He was part of a large national initiative that spans over five years called uh, the BC Cat Count. And over the last couple of years, he's been speaking at HSUS Expo. Um, and it's really, again, just using science and data because we're finally putting resources into studying these things. So learning more about the importance of how we're counting um, specifically community cat populations for exactly what Dr. Chris was talking about. So we understand really what our impact to those populations are and how to truly be reducing them in humane ways instead of just taking them out. The resources are still there. Animals are going to just gravitate right back. So Dr. John Boone. Um, he's a wildlife biologist and he has some really interesting speeches through the expo um, website as well as papers. Yeah, check them out. So for a small organization, we're very mighty between what we do here every single day, between what Dr. Chris is doing. Um, it's, it's truly remarkable. So, how do you feel about volunteering for an organization like this? Does it look fun? Does it sound cool? I I'm think already looking at trips. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, yeah, it's pretty cool. It is, um, it's, it's fun to do. You travel to new and exciting locations. You work hard. You really work hard. A lot of these organizations, you're up at five, six in the morning and you're not home until eight, nine o'clock at night because you, you're, you're working your butt off. Um, but it's very satisfying at work and you meet new people, um, ex 
experience, a deep sense of camaraderie. I mean, there's nothing like hard work <laughs> to get to know people and to bond uh, pretty quickly. Uh, you are contributing the greater good. You're sharing knowledge, personal growth. You bring back knowledge. I learn something every time I do this, for sure. Can you volunteer if you're not a vet or a vet tech? Yes. Sure, it just depends on the organization and kind of what their needs are. So these are some of the organizations that do these kinds of trips. Um, some are more international, some are more local. Uh, Helping Paws Across Borders is out of New Mexico and they are the organization that I went to the Spayathon for Puerto Rico with. I've been to Puerto Rico three times. Um, that's a whole nother presentation. <laughs> but uh, VITAS, I believe they're more focused in Mexico, Rural Area Veterinary Service. They work a lot with, um, uh, on reservations, uh, Native American populations, uh, World Vets more international. Soul Dog, they're pretty local in, at Navajo Lake Nation um, doing spay and neuter programs. SPCA International, more, again, international. So um, any of these you can Google and find, find online more information. Another one that's really interesting I'd throw out there is soy dogs, S-O-I dogs out of Thailand. Yeah. Um, they're trying to grow a little bit more in Southeast Asia, but Thailand um, is a big, big focus for them because the illegal dog meat trade. Yeah. And they do a lot of this work. I have work, I've donated to them and I don't know if you can volunteer with them or not. You have to get involved with uh, local organizations that they then yeah. use to, to put larger teams together. Yeah. But there's lots of. Lots of so lots. So thank you for giving I, people ideas. It's, yeah, I think I just incredible. got a few of them out there. There's, there's lots of people doing lots of good work out there, so. All right, I just wanted to show you um, some fun pictures from the Galapagos because after the, the, the campaign was over, then it was time to have some fun and be a tourist and see some of the cool stuff. Uh, so this is just sort of a free flow slideshow. Keisha mentioned the iguanas. <laughs> These guys are all over the place. You know, be careful where you're stepping. Are they nice? Do they come after you at all? No, they they scurry away. They're neutral. Yeah, they don't really care. <laughs> I feel like everywhere I travel, they're either nice or they come at you. <laughs> so I'm just wondering. Well, that's a lot. So what they what they say is that the animals on the Galapagos didn't develop a fear of predators because they didn't have predators. So you can walk right up to just about anything. That's the amazing. Yeah, yeah, including iguanas. So iguanas. Sea lions. Um, <laughs> the dogs of the sea. <laughs> the dogs of the sea, exactly. Here they are. Oh, they are so cute, but they can be so vicious. They are everywhere. Yeah. You don't wanna you don't wanna get too close. Definitely don't wanna sea mess lions, with them. No. Yeah. Sea lions. Sea lions. Seal the dog. Yeah, this is a sea lion. He or she actually we got a little close. <laughs> Sea lions have little ear flaps that helps you tell the yeah. difference kind of quickly. Here we are. This is uh, three. So Dr. Lauren, Dr. Will, and me just having a little fun. Um, he went off to do some um, uh, some education with some school groups. So um, animal balance is really, of course, into educating the younger ones too. Um, more pictures. Um, Ruta de la Tortuga, this is a path, um, this is at the Charles Darwin Research Center, and this is on the way to one of their tortoise um, conservation and breeding um, stations. And this is at the, the um, tortoise breeding station. This is Dr. Lauren and I standing in front of a sign that says, be responsible pet owner, sterilize. So we were happy to see that. Just a little about the Charles Darwin Research Station. This is on um, the island of Santa Cruz. They are still actively doing uh, research and um, supporting conservation. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful museum, and you can go and learn all about uh, Charles Darwin and 
all that. So 75% Ecuadorians is committed to the professional training of the permanent residents of the Galapagos. So more than more important than ever because the the human population on the Galapagos is growing just like it is everywhere else. And you know what happens when humans move in, the impact can be sterilization.
Ecuador is on the equator, <laughs> and this is the, this is zero for zero latitude, zero longitude. So that's, that's kind of wow. cool. And then I, um, this is just one of the many, many, many street dogs that I saw in, in the city. And that's, that's Quito. Quito is a city of about two million people, pretty, pretty big place. Um, one day we, we went mountain biking and uh, this was a super fun day. That's a huge uh, volcano behind us, uh, 18,000 feet, and apparently it's never clear. Our guide said in 31 years, he's like seen it clear about five times, so we were pretty lucky to wow. have a beautiful day. Wow. Uh, we mountain biked down to a hot springs, and we hung, and so we had a support car that brought our stuff, and then we hung out at the hot springs for about two hours, had lunch, and then we got back on our bikes, and uh, rode on a trail that is a old railroad uh, line. So a rails, you know, we've heard of many rails to trails. And that path kind of took us all through like the back neighborhoods of Quito, which was really, really cool to see because we saw like really wealthy neighborhoods and huge houses. And then we saw, you know, the more, you know, less rich areas of, of Quito. So this trip uh, was kind of, Pretty amazing from 15,000 feet down into into the city, and then the next day we got up at 5:30 and or got up, got picked up at 5:30 to go bird watching. Okay. Oh. So we went bird watching in the cloud forest, and uh, so it was all day, all day bird watching. Um, two of the really cool species we saw were a golden quetzal, a uh, cockatoo, <laughs> is a bird. Um, there she is nesting. So. We saw uh, about 83 species in one day, which oh, is wow. pretty, pretty awesome. Ecuador is very, very rich and diverse. We've got everything from cloud forest, high cloud forest, down to Amazon rainforest in, in the country. So that, that was super fun. And that's it. <laughs> Eventually, uh, that'll probably become um, you know another another program that they'll be doing. But right now, there's such a need, you know, for the, the medicine for the for the pets and just spaying for the, the people's pets. Laura, I commend you for using our branding colors on your final slide. That's a very <laughs> nice job. <touch. Yeah. laughs> hey, plus. Plus, that was so great. Yeah, I'd yeah. love for this presentation to be one of the, you know, CE AVMA presentations. Yeah, when we get that would be cool. those regular meetings, so I think it'd be very impactful. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Help you have CE meetings here? That would be awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that could be really impactful. Cool. Well, I'm glad you, glad you liked it. <laughs> yeah, cool. One of the cool things too, you know, about traveling in general is it helps you come home and really appreciate what you have. Um, and I think especially in the world of animal welfare, we have a tendency to get bogged down in the day-to-day -day difficulty of what we do, but we're incredibly fortunate to be in a well-funded organization in the community that supports us. I highly encourage all of you to, to travel as much as you can and volunteer, you learn so much. And you gain a lot of self-confidence because you don't realize what a good problem solver you are until you're in a situation where you need to do it. Um, 
but you know animals worldwide especially street dogs and street cats um, not to mention all the wildlife are really suffering so i commend you dr chris thank you so much yeah thank you for making it possible